And we're live. So. Are you sure? We could be dead. Yeah. Well, that would be a different kind of podcast now, wouldn't it? It's so, a very strange podcast. <laughs> it, it would be. I don't want to join that podcast. All right, but see, you got to die to get there. So we'll just move right along. <laughs> hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans, it's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies. A place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. So without further ado, we're going to let our incredible guest, Mr. Bryce O'Connor, introduce himself. Woo-hoo. All right, hey, y'all. Um, I'm Bryce O'Connor. I'm the author of uh, The Wings of War, uh, The Shattered Reigns, and uh, Stormweaver. I'm also the CEO and creative director of Wraithmark's uh, Creative, which has been producing a lot of stuff over the, the, the course of the last year. And I am super excited to, to be here. Also, for those of you watching, that is my dog, Arrow, very important special guest. <laughs> Outstanding. He looks like a good boy. Yes, he is. All right. So the next part of the introduction, dear listener, is how we first found them. So I uh, was looking for paneled guests to uh, to record that would be understanding that uh, when we start recording episodes for the finalists for Dragon Con, that this, these episodes might have to take a back seat for a week or two. So I let Seska schedule these because she knew all the people that might actually be at the Dragon Con. So of course they would understand. Um, and so that's how I found Bryce. But Seska, what bar did you meet him in? Actually. <laughs> I met him at the Fantasy Gather at Dragon Con. Yes. Which did not have a bar, despite the copious amounts of booze that were actually in there in the room. I thought I tricked <laughs> you for a second. She's like, ah, ha, ha, I'll see you and raise you free booze. It, it might as well have been a bar. Let's, let's be it real. It might as well have been a bar. At every table you went, what had it? My, my track second uh, is, a light, is not a lightweight and was having problems walking around with her clipboard. I mean, do you guys not realize that's that's how we we sell books? We intoxicate all of our readers, and we're like, "Here, buy this," and they're like, "No inhibitions, no problems." It works. It seems <laughs> to definitely work. Um, so that's how we met, and then we got to talking also because you're friends with Davis, who we've had on the podcast. Yes, I am. Um, Michael Chatfield, who we've had on the podcast. Yes, all both of them and significantly so, cooler than I am. Uh, and Jay Boyce, actually, you're the person who introduced me to Jay. Yes. So thank you for that because she's phenomenal. Um, so yeah, so um, that's how we met. And I was just saying, as old mm-hmm. age makes my hair fall out, I might have to hit her up for her wig supplier. <laughs> Jay, is Jay. Oh, tell tell me about it. It's not even old age yeah. for me. It's just like <laughs> it all went she, uh, about six she was, months. She said she just wants to accessorize her hair color with her uh, her outfit, so she just bought a bunch of them. And I'm like, I might have to hit her up for some for some links oh, that, or something. That, that girl's style is on point. Like she, like I've seen her like like changing her profile pictures and stuff, and she just nails it. It's seriously impressive. She's All amazing. Right. Yeah. All right, Doc. So, we got to ask him the religion questions or other. If he gets it wrong, we might have to kick your friend from the show. Uh oh. Nah, he won't get them wrong. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Starship Troopers, Firefly, or Fifth Element? Oh my God! All right, I I I gotta go with Firefly. <laughs> I, I gotta okay, go Brown with Firefly. Shirt. I gotta go Brown with Firefly. Broncos, Broncos for the win, absolutely for sure. Do I need to explain you know my what? choices, or can we just go Firefly? It was it was so amazing they could only make thirteen episodes of it. Oh, See, and, not- <sighs> Now you said that, I actually want to hear your reasoning. Because, I mean, it should be just like, well, duh, Firefly. Because but. Nathan Fillion is a national treasure, even though I think he's Canadian? Is he Canadian? Maybe? I'm gonna, no. I don't know. No, I gotta look Because Nathan Fillion is a fucking genius. That's why. That's 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 it. And everyone else, Gina Torres, like everyone else. And the, the they, they just created a show that was so, like, it just touched. Touched. It, it, uh, never, never mind. Just that. It's just... Uh, all of it, yeah. I love it. It's great. It's great. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. We would have accepted Fifth Element as a uh, as an alternate, and um, okay, just share. Now on to the polytheistic one because we are oh Conan the Barbarian, The Witcher, or Doctor Who, which is really <sighs> Doctor Who. Is that really fantasy, Jr.? You would have picked that one this time. Oh, didn't you? oh hey, I mean I- like. Time Lord, come on. It's weird. It it can't be sci-fi. No. 
send the hate mail to uh, Nick Garber at blastersblakepodcast.com because <laughs> he's well, not here to I, defend himself. I don't know. Science science fantasy is a, is a real thing. Maybe, 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 uh, Dr. It is. Star Wars there. is in the science fantasy genre. Yeah. Too. Yeah. 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 I, I, I think I'd go for science fantasy. Uh, that being said, my answer is not uh, Doctor Who, and given the fact that I keep wanting to say The Who, that, that shows you how, how ingrained I am in the Whovian culture, um, the answer has to, be, has to be The Witcher, hands down, without even... The Witcher even. is pretty amazing. I, though I did listen to some of the audiobooks, and they were very different than the show, in a yeah. way. Very, very okay. matching though. Um, there's a lot of like everything came back to food or sex or both. <laughs> Even if it had is nothing there, to do with is, either is of them. More, is there more in life? Like, are, are, what are you talking about? That's that's everything. So hold on, hold on. But but here now, I have a question that might make me leave. So, Doc, <laughs> you you mentioned you mentioned the books and the show, which granted, great. But have you experienced like the Witcher like medium? The game, so, yes. The Witcher medium, as in the games. The video games, yeah. Have I you don't play video games. Okay, how do I leave? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have time. I'm reading books. I, I, you, you need to take time to play The Witcher Three. It is genuinely one of the most incredible experiences from a fantasy fantasy aspect. That you, it, it is reading a book that you can involve yourself in. Like and it's so much more visceral. No, it's not. Just I, I've like, watched them. I've not played them. I've watched my brothers play them, and I will admit they are the only video game I will actually watch somebody play. Oh, they're, they're so I, I because they the do Who, have story, and I enjoy that. I put story. Doctor Who, or we, which will here on out be referred to as just the Who, on there the because I think the Daleks are dumb, and uh, we might have single handedly started the uh, second war with Great Britain. The the Redcoats might come back to fight us over this one, but um, no, I'm willing not. to. I'm willing to take a stand on that hill. It's okay because all they got are knives. I, I don't. I don't <laughs> know who the. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get hate for this. I don't know who the Daleks are. Uh, like I. They're like the trash can okay. with a plunger on the end. Dear heavenly God, uh, both it's like of a you. trash can it's with a plunger Dalek. on the end. The things that goes like. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Okay. Daleks. That's how you pronounce it. Dalek. You pronounce it dumb. Dalek. Dumb. <laughs> I'm not gonna oh piss my off goodness! Any All the hate mail can go to Jr. this time. I, I'm not gonna piss off any Hoovians. I'm sure it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful show. I just haven't partaken partaken yet. <laughs> I have to be in the right mood for Doctor Who. I will admit that. But moving on. So, which was your first love, sci-fi or fantasy? Oh, fantasy. That's a. Uh, so sci-fi is sci-fi is very second to me. Not not because of not because of quality. Um, <laughs> Uh, like it, it's a it's a massive genre, and I completely understand the the appreciation. My most successful project to date is a, is a science fantasy that's more heavily sci-fi, but um, fantasy has just been my entire life. I have I have two dragon tattoos. I remember the first place I was when I discovered the art of Magic: The Gathering. Um, I remember where I was what was when I was reading Red Wall. I remember the like fantasy has just been that escape from from reality that really that really puts in perspective the, the whole concept of like a non-reader lives one life and, a, and a, a reader lives a thousand lives. Like fantasy was the place where I could just go and become somebody else or something else. and just experience a, a world that was so different and yet so comfortable that I, I just, I forgot about everything else. I forgot my name. I forgot my problems. I forgot that high school sucks. Like it, it just, fantasy and it may just be that i didn't discover sapphire early enough but fantasy is definitely where it is no i, I i'm laughing because i remember uh i got in trouble from a history teacher because i was not working quote hard enough to remember <laughs> uh all who kings were what kings and queens and the numbers with them in england and she goes i know you can do this because you can keep <laughs> track of all the dark over novels yeah. all the Pern novels and she's like and you don't miss a beat and you get them all right every time you can do this and i'm like this it's, not it's a lot more interesting exactly <laughs> exactly it's not a fair comparison apples to like no i'm like oranges. king and i just leave like a blank and yeah. I'm like, I don't remember. I'm like king james the and then i just write x for the number yeah. like it was a math yeah. problem 
<laughs> oh, right solve for X. No, no, she was like, I didn't understand why you did X, and then you did Y on another one, and I'm like, she's like, did you really do math variables? And I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what was your first memory of engaging in speculative fiction? So, you said your first your first memory was, or your first love was fantasy, but was your first engagement with either genre fantasy as well? And if so, what? So, so first memory period or first positive memory? Because those are two very different things. Oh, tell oh, us both. Then. Oh my God! So, first memory ever. I, 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 I just like really, really digging back here is nightmares from watching ET. Like I was probably four or five you years think old. You think ET was creepy? So, so I was four or five years old. Also, fun fact: it's not ET phone homes. He doesn't say that. It's no, ET home phone. But um, no, ET e for a four to five year old, v creepy. Like, yes, absolutely. No, I understand that. I had an ET doll when I was like two. That was bigger than I was. Why? <laughs> No, I. It was not my. It was a gift. It was not my idea. <laughs> Someone wanted to traumatize you early on in life. It um, was. I, I. My dad told me it was the biggest stuffed animal in the in the toy store in Saudi Arabia, and that he thinks is why his friend gave it to me. Hey, you know that'll that'll do it. He was just just just. It's the thought that counts. It not comes the up to trauma. I am a full counts. grown five eleven woman, and it comes up to my hip. I'm a I'm a full grown six foot one two hundred pound man, and I still have nightmares about ET. So I, I completely understand. <laughs> so, so what was your first positive memory? We'll we'll move past your trauma and send you the bill for counseling sessions. Because oh, we give Bryce E PTSD. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. So my first um, my first positive my first positive memory is I, I, the uh, I think it has to be my discovery of um, Magic the Gathering art. I was probably seven or eight and I was I was in France, actually talking about talking about being abroad. I was in France with um, some cousins and I saw these card packs and I was like, oh, that, that's cool. It was like tiny little kiosk where you buy like your cigarettes and your newspaper back in back in the, the early to mid nineties. Um, and I saw some Magic card packs and I, 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 picked, uh, I picked one of those up. Someone's gonna date me on this because they're gonna know that the when the magic cards came out exactly, and they're gonna be like, "No, that was that was way too early." Um, and I cracked them open, and actually, Doc, you'll you'll appreciate this. Uh, the the rare card was um, a uh, was a platinum angel, which was uh, done, and I hope I'm not wrong about this, by Brom, who was actually the guest uh, artist at Dragon Con last year, or wow, last year, freaking COVID, uh, in 2019. Um, so I actually got to take that card, uh, this, this like, it, I just remember like opening those and being like, whoa, just that wash of just suddenly like oh, this, this gorgeous, gorgeous art. And I managed to take that card uh, and get it signed by Brahm last year at, uh, at Dragon. Oh, Con. that's I, amazing. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think I think that is the most, that is the positive, uh, the first positive um, experience I have. It was that or Redwall, but, but either way they were just, no, I never really got into Magic the Gathering, but I do love the art. And some of my favorite artists have done Magic the Gathering cards. You know so what? what is, my cousin what is, was very, my cousin, who was the only person I knew who played it, was the most annoying, creepy person I've met. Uh, yeah, yeah. You, you so got it, it just like yeah. threw me off. To, I mean, to be fair, I, I was in, I've been into Magic since I remember, except I only started playing in like 2013. So mm -hmm. like the like I get I, the art is enough to, to get you into it, especially if you're if you're a, a speculative fiction gearhead or whatever you want to call it. But yeah, the, it's it's a whole different beast. So it was released in '93. I did a quick Google by Wizards of the Coast. So 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 Magic was, but Platinum Angel. So so specifically, like 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 hardcore Magic fans are going to be able to tell you like exactly like when the first Platinum Angel printing happened and what set that was in and how early it could have been. Um, so it like, it, it's, it's, it's a lot. No, but of, I do know, I know the artwork you're talking about and it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. It was Platinum Angel was 2011, according to another quick Google search. So I, I must've been, I must've been 11 years old cause it was the new set. Um, yeah, that's a, yeah. God. Okay. So what is it about speculative fiction that you love? Uh, can I, can I give the most like generic answer and then try to give a much more creative explanation? Sure. sure. <laughs> escapism. Uh, 
it, it's it's really I think it's the reason why so many people are into speculative fiction. And it's the and it's the escapist aspect. And um, I was uh, I was raised uh, by wonderful wonderful parents, and I I had a lot of good friends. I did I did not by any means have a hard time growing up or have a hard childhood, but everyone has problems and everyone has struggles. Um, and what got me through those struggles, um, especially especially through middle school and high school, was um, fantasy and, and speculative fiction and the ability to come home from school, which was really hard for either like, I, I don't wanna say like bullying and all this stuff because it's gonna make it sound like I had this, I had this really hard time, which I didn't. I genuinely had a, had a great childhood. I got beat up once and then I was six foot one in the eighth grade and no one beat me up anymore. Um, but the, the struggles that I had, the, the solve, the solution, the, the, um, the, the healing potion was always, always, always speculative fiction and fantasy. Um, and like once, once something affects you like that, once something stitches you together and fills those holes as you're growing up, it, it, it never leaves you. Like it just, I, I will be. I consider myself a fairly a fairly trusted individual, but I'm gonna be 95 in a fucking wheelchair, and my wheelchairs are gonna have like dragon rims on it, and I'm gonna be rolling around like throwing magic cards at people, being annoying. Like it's never it's never gonna go away, and I don't want it to ever. All right, so Hasbro is gonna start the old folks home for Magic the Gathering, and you're gonna be Woo! the first uh, inmate. I mean, patient. <laughs> so it's, it's not an inmate if you're there willingly. <laughs> so how did your love of speculative fiction transition into writing stories uh, I, in that I, space you know i don't know um and uh, like i don't I, I i don't know like how how other people how other people answer that but I, I honestly all i know is that i was i was nine years old i remember specifically wow it, it really must have been much earlier that i had a positive uh that whole magic story that was 2011 i really must have like had earlier, earlier um, interactions, because I remember being nine years old, walking to uh, my elementary school with my, my best friend, David, at the time, who is going to be a race mark author, which is really cool. Um, and, uh, and I remember telling him, like, I want to be a writer. And I don't remember for the, for like the, the hell of me, like, how that happened. <laughs> I don't remember where I was like, like, this stuff is really good. I think I could do that because at what point I developed that stupid level of overconfidence, I could not tell you as a nine-year-old. Um, but um, if, if I had to guess, I think it's just, I think it's just a desire to elicit in other people what speculative fiction has and continues to, to elicit in me, which is just joy. Like either, either joy at, at, at experiencing those characters or joy of being able to leave behind like your world for for a little bit and and anyone who's stood on top of a mountain or been to space shot up in a big metal uh orifice uh will tell you that like like leaving the not orifice uh <laughs> offenders um will tell you that escaping the world for for a little bit is blissful in its own right so for the kids listening if you drink your oval teen you too could be a wraith marked author just uh, eat your vegetables <laughs> But, speaking, um, of, so, speaking of kids listening, am I allowed to curse here? Is this a, is this a family friendly? I don't actually think any kids listen. I, I other than Doc making her son when he's like once on the internet. I don't think any uh, kids. When he wants to watch stuff. YouTube and he won't leave me alone, this is I put up this song. All right, well, I've got I've got a sailor's mouth, so I've I've like I've like silently bleeped myself about twenty seven times already. So I'll, oh, no, I'll, no, I'll, we've I'll, had like John Hartness on. We've had Casey Azell. She went really like five minutes in. It's like, well, there one our safe for work rating. Uh, she's oh. the only episode we have that we couldn't monetize. <laughs> okay, well, I will, I will try to not demonetize you guys. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So many authors let their own real life experiences influence the stories they tell. So besides getting shot up into space and metal orifices or or appendices, appendages, appendages. Um, <laughs> were, were there any specific formidable moments that shaped you as a storyteller? Yeah, um, and uh, and honestly, it was it was the harder times in my life, which is which is weird to say because I, um, I like I, I really hate saying that because again, I didn't have that hard a time. But but given given how fantasy and how speculative fiction really like patched those those holes for me, when I when I write, I tend to create characters who were 
who are a bit like me. I, I, I write almost exclusively male uh, main protagonists, although I, I do really try to make my, my female secondary characters carry carry their badass array right, uh, around No, he, you have good, fem strong female characters. Otherwise, I wouldn't have read your books. I, okay. I would have put them down and walked away. I would have been like, I'm good. Yes, I'm done. Badge, badge of honor. Um, that's actually really good to know. I just, uh, quick, quick side note. I just had a, uh, a conversation with, actually, I don't know that might get you demonetized. Never mind. I just had a, uh, uh, a conversation with, um, a very, a very, a very strong, um, female individual who works in a very specific industry that would get you demonetized, but, uh, and, and just talking about like female empowerment and, and, and all sorts of stuff. It was research. Give me a break. Um, <laughs> no, I, um hit us up after uh, the show stops recording. Cause now I'm curious. <laughs> Here, I'll do it. I'll do it. And I'll do it in the side chat. And uh, just just so you know, it was a platonic. It was a platonic conversation. We had an author admit to doing and doing research in red light districts. Oh, yeah. I I, I tried. I just tried to. Uh, I just tried to. You just tried to find contact. one. What? I just not a red light district. I live in Rochester, New York. Are you kidding me? Like like there ain't no red light districts around here. I'll go. I'll go back to Paris and find some really interesting spots if I want to. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but anyways, we were talking about, this is, this is my, this is, this is my brain on, on, on fantasy. Um, <laughs> we're talking about my influences and then I went on a tangent about things getting you demonetized. Oh, and we're talking about, uh, how, how it's influenced uh, my aspect. So, uh, I typically write male, um, uh, uh, pro tags who are struggling some kind of underdog, um, and and that eventually led into progression fantasy, which was a whole different beast. But um, I I write the kid that I used to feel like, um, and I'm very very fortunate in that I don't I don't feel that that way anymore. Like physically, yes. Like like Doc could could like knock my lights out with a flick of her finger. I guarantee. Um, but but uh, emotionally and and mentally and 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 all that stuff, I'm, I'm much more healthy now. But I still reach back to that kid who who started writing when he was in, in middle school and high school and, and who wrote and created characters who he could relate to briefly and then allowed them to become stronger and become their their own person and 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 I, I don't know like become interesting and fascinating people I, I hope uh, so as weird as it is my, my own experience absolutely definitely um, fed into fed into my writing so okay transitioning a bit to an adjacent topic the fan angle have you had any cool fan art or people cosplay a character yet <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you guys are really trying to demonetize your your podcast <laughs> is where you are um yes i've i've had some some fantastic uh, some fantastic fan art most recently um with the warform series um uh shout out to leafy art guy uh on the r warform subreddit who does uh like 3d renderings of um, some of the weapons and, and stuff in in that world, but so uh, for for the shattered rain specifically, I I actually haven't, but I had for the wings of war, I, I had someone send me a tattoo of uh, of the cover art of the cover art, not even like a weird tattoo, but they had put it in a place that I was just like, love the art, man, and you got to give me the name of your artist, but why would you put it there? <laughs> 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 what, what is the point of that? Um, but uh, yeah, I've I've had some I've had some really cool stuff. I have some wonderful fans, uh, and I have some very enthusiastic fans who I love dearly um, that have given me some some really neat stuff over the years. Questions, cool. but neat. <laughs> <laughs> so, has anybody asked for your autograph out in public at a convention or a book signing? <laughs> or away from <laughs> you're 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 already you're already laughing because maybe you know the story so so you said you you've had davis on on this uh on this channel as, uh, as well davis ashura who's a very dear friend of mine and a wonderful yeah. wonderful writer um <laughs> davis uh myself as well as uh phil tucker dirk ashton and and a couple of other friends are this kind of tight-knit group when we go to dragon con um, and the only place that I would ever meet anybody who knows uh, who who the hell I am would be at at, at Dragon Con or the like because I'm I am not so big that I could just walk into Barnes and Noble and people would be like, "You, you're the bald guy who writes books." And I'm like, "Yeah, that guy." Um, <laughs> Admittedly, there are yeah. a lot of bald guys who write books. That's true. I think it's like a trend. I think it's a thing. Like I think I'm just following the trend. Um, but <laughs> I'm telling this entire story to give you the short answer. No, I've never been asked to uh, 
to sign a book. But what I do get asked is, <laughs> is I always get end up being the bag boy at Dragon Con because it'll be Davis, Dirk, myself, Phil, and the only person who ever gets asked to sign a book is Davis. And Davis will get asked to, uh, to sign like five books in a day. And we're just all standing, like we're, like we're all very successful in our own right. Like all of us across have sold like tens of thousands of copies of books, hundreds of thousands of copies of books, but there's freaking Davis on one knee, like signing one book after the other while we're literally holding his bags and being like, yeah, check his schedule. Like make sure that he has time for lunch. Like is, do you have a It is very like, adorable. You yeah, you've so, seen us. You've seen our posse. <laughs> it's a good time. So what, any, any fan saying, out there at Dragon Con, you can find us. <laughs> saying is you're like the Tony Hawk very world. Pete's your but, stuff, but they might not what you look like or who you He gets well, the people you, you like cut out there. Oh no, it's it's um and your signal is weak. Um oh, it's, no, I said, oh, it's my fault. It's my fault. Okay, all right. I see, I yeah, see, the see. stream here tells me who's got the weak signal. Um, but uh, the uh, it says that I was saying that you were the basically like the, the Tony Hawk of the uh, of the literary world then. Super successful, and people are like, Oh, your name like that famous skater dude to him. Because they don't know what he looks like, they just know the name. So that's you is what, what you're telling us. Comparing me to Tony Hawk is so flattering, you have no idea. <laughs> like my my level, I I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pretend that I don't have a certain level of success. I'm very 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 fortunate, um, especially like with indies, like especially among indies, the number of, of books I've sold, I, I'm I'm very very proud of, and I'm I'm very very lucky. Uh, but like on the whole, like <laughs> you go you go to Dragon Con and, and like like indie authors will have a booth, and at my level, you sell like 20 books throughout Dragon Con, and you're really happy, and they're all the super fans, and the rest of the time you're just like, would you would you like to would you like to buy it? No, okay, all right. Versus Brandon Sanderson never actually shows up at his booth except to sign. He has four assistants. And if they're not careful, they'll sell out of all their books in two hours. They have so, four. But, <laughs> oh, yeah. He's got like eight assistants. Like, I, well, like, wait, are, we counting the, entire posse. are we counting the, the bird that he has in all his live signings that he does on his channel? He's got like a parakeet bird? or something. Bird. Brandon Sanderson, yeah. If you go to his – when he does his signings where he'll talk about his books – or you watch the the YouTube videos? He's got a bird, like it's like a parakeet or something. What? It's I green. A bird. I got. You got to get a bird right here. You got yeah, something cooler. You got a dog. So much cuter. Yeah, the this is true. The the bird seems kind of annoying. It's always getting in his way. So I, I, think I don't want to. I don't want to insult any of Brandon Sanderson's assistants because they have more power in life than I do. So I'm not going <laughs> to compare them to any birds. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. All right, Doc. Save me from. I will save you from yourself. So <laughs> why don't you give us the Reader's Digest highlight reel of everything you've written? Oh, my God. You the don't have to go through every title, but you can be like, so I did this thing, and it's this. And I did this thing, and it's like a military academy, and I've done this thing. And blah, 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 blah. Oh, okay. All right. Well, uh, to give myself time to think, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the, I'm going to start with the one thing that I actually have an elevator pitch for, which Dirk Ashton helped me come up with two years, three years ago at Dragon Con. <laughs> um, the Wings of War is essentially the story of the Punisher if Frank Castle was a dragon, um, which is very satisfying when, when you, when you say that to someone and they're like, I love the Punisher. You're like, but do you like dragons? They're like, no, not really. And I'm like, okay, well, whatever. Um, but uh, so the Wings of War, Punisher of Frank Castle was a dragon. After that, it was The Shattered Reigns, which is the, the book I wrote when I was 15 and decided that I needed a break from the Wings of War and, and I polished it off uh, and republished it and uh, decided that dragons should also wield swords. Uh, so there's that bonus. Um, it's, essentially a, it's essentially a traditional uh, sword and sorcery, except my dragon is really cool. I'm very, very proud of my dragon. My uh, my main character is a little white bread, not gonna lie. Um, but uh, but I wrote him when I was fifteen, so give me a break. And I really do try to make him better. <laughs> um, but my my dragon is awesome. Um, and then uh, I uh, I also co-wrote um, uh, the the Godforge Chronicles, and I say co-wrote loosely because T uh, uh, T L Greylock gets all of the the credit, which is a fantastic story about um, uh, an archaeologist essentially like trying to save the world uh, in a fantasy world. And it's it's brilliantly written, and and I, I really wish it got more attention than than it did. Um, and then most recently, I wrote um, the <laughs> the famous series that has three names because I couldn't decide. Uh, the Stormweaver series inside the Warform universe. The first book is called Iron Prince, which is 
um, a true underdog uh, progression science fantasy epic. And by epic, I mean it's 10% longer than the first Game of Thrones, which I did not expect going in. Um, and it uh, it essentially follows uh, uh, an underdog with with the willpower of a friggin' uh, train um, as he eventually becomes uh, a, a a war god, which is going to yeah, be that's very the cool. one that you challenged me to have it read by the time I, we did the podcast. <laughs> and you're insane! It's 34 hours long in audio. <laughs> you started it 12 hours ago. How did you finish it in time? Uh, and I didn't even do it long. I, I did not even speed it up. God, yeah, while well, all of us do that at times, the readers really don't like to hear you when you say you just sped their work. We will uh, yeah. we will yeah. make you admit to nothing, and we will move on. Yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> Those all sound fast, but we'll talk a little bit about A Mark of Kings, which is the first book in the Shattered Rain series. So where did you first get the premise for this idea? How did you come up with... Uh, with it, was it psychedelics, Ouija board, uh, the body funk at Dragon Con, overpowering your senses? I've well, uh, given that given that I was fifteen, it was definitely psychedelics and Ouija board. Don't tell my parents. Um, <laughs> uh, it all no, makes not sense so much. now. Yeah, there you go. That's how I ended up like this. Probably the lots of hair too. Um, but uh, I, honestly, I, like I, it, I struggle to remember these things sometimes. Like, like I just. <laughs> I need to I need to like remember these stories, but uh, the one major influence that that I know that I know fed into um, uh, a Mark of Kings, which was I can't remember what the original title it was, but um, and then spilled over into the Wings of War after uh, was the Elder Scrolls series. Which um, Doc, I know you don't you don't play video games with JR. No, I played that were... one. I played it on the computer. Okay, did you play? Do you remember which which one you played? Uh, Morrowind, Morrowind, Elder Morrowind. Scrolls, and Spyridel. It was more. I played yeah. a bit of the Scrolls, I did, but I played more of Morrowind. Yeah. Now, so, Mar Elder Scrolls is the name of the franchise, the universe, and then there were sub kingdoms that had their own games. It's okay. She likes she likes the Marvel universe, but she also likes Iron Man. It's okay. No judgment here. I, I'm not that fond of Iron Man, actually. But I, I really, really, really like computer games better than video video games. So, you got me if it's a video game. Yeah, I'm not gonna touch. I'm not gonna touch that one. I didn't grow I'm, up with video games. I grew up with computer games. Uh, 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 never mind. We're, we're. I'm. I'm. I'm not. I'm not gonna touch. I'm not gonna touch that one. Um. <laughs> um. Anyways, we were talking about Morrowind. Uh. And uh. And Morrowind was the first. I, I played a lot of GameCube before Morrowind, but it was Smash Bros. and and that sort of stuff. And Morrowind, I I remember where I was when I picked up Morrowind. Um, I remember like picking it up off the Blockbuster shelf. For those of you who are too young to remember, Blockbuster was a very successful uh, video game and movie rental business that went out of business when I was like 25, which is sad. Um, I actually, but, uh, when I was cleaning uh, my room, I found my old card. Your old Blockbuster That's card? That's probably actually there's still one one franchise. You should go check it out. It's like in Washington or something. Yeah, I thought it was in Alaska, but I know there's one still open. Like, and then there was one. It's not I wonder if that out. means if he could go after, like, he could probably get rich just going after everyone that still had late fees and return fees oh for stores God. that went out of business. Can you do what's a reverse class action lawsuit when one person sues like 10 million people? <laughs> I don't know. He'd oh, be like man. that guy, can, you know, that extend, cars extended warranty. He's like, can we talk about your late fees to Blockbuster? <laughs> I just saw a meme where some dude who's putting flooring down for a new house is like he wrote that in Sharpie on like the underflooring, and he's like, in fifty years, people are going to be like, what the hell is that? Um, but uh, but yeah, Morrowind, Morrowind, the Elder Scrolls was was a huge huge influence. Where I just I always played the Argonians, um, unless I was playing the the Dark Elves, but uh, the, just the the concept that was my that was my exposure to like the the first Anthro character, the first like Dragon Man. And I got hooked on that idea. I had always been in love with dragons. I have two dragons statued on me and 76 more to come. I've, well, I did, I'm moving, but I had four dragons just in my sight here. And when I, when I realized that dragon men were a thing, uh, that sounds weird saying it out loud. When I realized that dragon people were, were a thing, I was hooked, hooked on that. Um, and that fed right into uh, right into a Mark of Kings, where the the secondary character was the first character I, I came up with, and then I was like, oh, but I need an interesting, I need an interesting lead character. Let's go with a white guy 
who's young, handsome, tall, huge, really good with a sword, and probably saves the girl in like page two. I thought that was a great idea. So yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> the uh, the Morrowind campaign is really the only one where the Aragonians made sense because there wasn't a whole lot of like water for them to be useful. Yeah. And I hated yeah, the Khajiit. Yeah. Like the cats were just annoying. God, but they made such good sneaky boys. They were fun. They did. And fall caravans, like when you would, would deal with them as traders. It was kind of cool, yeah. but anyway. All right. In Skyrim, so this they is, were in Skyrim. They were great. Yeah, I like Skyrim. I could have been an adventurer, but I took an arrow to the knee. <laughs> I laugh whenever an author puts that in their book. I've seen it a couple of times where people will put that in as a as a throwaway line. And I'm like, every time I hear that, I can't help but laugh. You you just you just made me realize what my next tattoo is is probably gonna be. I so I like to tattoo things that are very meaningful to me, but that don't but are just like jump out wow. That I don't know if you guys can hear that. There's a lot of thunder yeah, going on. Um and uh, and I'd like to, to to tattoo stuff on me that's like representative of something that you don't immediately recognize. So I'm gonna get some kind of like tribal like arrowhead on my knee. <laughs> <laughs> and the first person the first person who recognizes it is Skyrim is gonna get like a hundred bucks. You got to get one of the runes from like Skyrim, that, which is sort of a bastardization of of the Norse. Like yeah. Get one of their runes with it. That that'll that'll. Yeah. that'll T.L. Greylock would would have my manhood and my head. Like, sh like she's so knowledgeable of uh, a, a, a writing partner, T.L. Greylock, um, who did Song of the Ash for a fantastic series. Uh, she's so knowledgeable of, of Norse mythology. And like, if I put anything remotely bastardized from Norse mythology, she would literally skin that part of my body, probably. So, in yeah, the best I, possible I know way. We should have her on. She sounds you like You should. Fun. Oh, she's awesome. You should have her on. All right, that's going to be a she's thing now. We'll, we'll talk offline. So before we dig into the specifically to the book, let's take a minute and look at this glorious cover. So what's the story behind this? Because that is that is like grade A sexy right there. Uh, the story the story behind that is that <laughs> Billy Christian is a is a is a triple A level artist, and I, I I really was sad that we couldn't get him for the for the second cover. Um, not that it, Yam Yam Mansik Yang for the for the, the cover of Bloody Kings did a fantastic job, but Billy is is really a uh, a, a he's, he's a talent when it comes to art. Um, and he he brought he brought the concept that I was really going for. So there's a, there's a lot going on in this cover from a, from a marketing perspective as well. Not just like we wanted something really cool, but we also wanted characters to pop in thumbnail. And so Billy was like, we'll put them on a white background, but make the white background really, really cool. And then that dragon with a sword thing, we got to do that. Um, so there's a lot going on. And then not to not to miss out on the credit, um, SDK Creations, Sean King uh, did the typography for this. He does the typography for all of the Wraithmark um, stuff. There is no one like him. I, I, <laughs> I, I would say like reach out to him if you need, if you need work, but he is so swamped and so busy between Wraithmark and all the other uh, people that that he has that like they the two of them working together just created this like stunning art piece that to this day is is one of my favorite uh, my favorite pieces and if 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 you like if you like art like uh, Sean's work with pretty much anything that we put out there or pretty much anything period uh, is just absolutely gorgeous I, I fanboy about art by the way wraith marked is is very very particular about the art that we work with mostly because i'm very very particular about the art that we work with and this was just one of so a stunning who, example who picked the typography because that looks looks a lot like the um the dragon lance books where you brand it with the where you branded the shattered reins at the bottom that yep. sort of look to it was that intentional yeah. or just am i seeing it because it's got dragons in it that's that's Sean being brilliant. Um, Sean Sean is uh, uh, again Sean T King S T K Creations. Sean uh, is not only a, a a brilliant typographer, he's also a, a fantasy fan, so he has a lot of experience in in the field as a as a reader and 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 an ingester. Um, so he'll look at one thing and be like, "Let's go in this direction," and nine times out of ten, it's correct. And nine times out of ten, I'll also be like, "No, we should go in this direction," and then he'll do what I want. And I was like, "No, you were totally right. Do your thing anyway." Uh, so my title as creative art director is very, very loose, but um, but no, that's that's just on being brilliant, knowing knowing how to knowing how to market, knowing how to to use space and real estate appropriately, and 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 making a book that that harkens back to uh, to the comforts of the older the older the older style, so that 
yeah, the older classics so that older readers will look at that and be like this, this, you know, gives me a nostalgic feeling, but also that clean metallic sheen and edge that makes new readers be like, Ooh, pretty, yeah, pretty much it. I, I can appreciate that. So the all right. Pretty part. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't see colors like a lot of people. So I really dig this one that it's sort of in like a grayscale of effect. Yeah. Cause I can see a lot more detail on this than it I normally It plays to his strengths. <laughs> Yeah. It does. It does. This, but this I really is like for you. I see. I told you I was special, Doc. Um, so uh, nobody I, argued that you were special. We just wondered how much Ed was behind it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I was infantry. So moving on to the book itself, what would your thirty-second elevator pitch for uh, a Mark of Kings be? Oh no! I, I was supposed to. I was supposed to prep this, but it took me five years to come up with the elevator pitch for the Wings of War. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I will admit, I'm, I'm going to throw him a bone. And one of the reasons we love this, I love this question so much, is it's kind of fun watching all the authors flounder. <laughs> you just like you get you get the the big eyes like that blow up, and they're like, "Oh, I wrote." I mean, it. we did have one person who's like, "I got you," and he's and he just read off the back of his book until he got to thirty seconds. Oh, there they. Oh, it's a thirty second elevator. I can I can pick up the back of the book here and. Uh, I've got a, I've got a really good. You want to do this? You want, you want to do this right now? Here we go. All right, but you've got to do it in an, a funny accent. I don't care what it is, but you got or a movie it. voice. Movie and trailer movie, work. I, I don't have a movie. I can do a French accent and a very very bad French accent if you want. Oh, I've heard your French that accent. It is very bad. Doc, 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 I speak French, which is really annoying that my French accent is that bad. <laughs> okay. All right. Are we, are we putting on the clock a thirty second timer for this? Sure. All right, here we go. Uh, despite his youth, Declan Idras knows of the evils of the world. You know, no, I can't do this. This is not. Are you <laughs> kidding me? <laughs> it's so cheesy. Oh, it's so. All right, hold on, um, hold on. You got to try it one more time. No, let's, let's get, no, no, no. Yes. No, here, do if it. We're going, if we're going full screen, we can just be distracted. Be distracted by by my my handsome boy. Oh. <laughs> All right. Okay. okay. If I fail this time, can I just read it in a normal, boring Bryce voice? No. You could just jump to the normal, boring Bryce voice, so we have more time to talk about your book. Deal. About thirty seconds. No, that's 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 awful. People are going to get bored really quick. So essentially, what it is is boring white bread, uh, white guy, big guy with sword uh, ends up getting trained by a dragon who is for some reason a sword master. Also meets magic elf girl and her weird magic dad, and then. They beat the bad guys and decide to go spelunking, but there's a lot more cool stuff than that. So Wait, there you go. That's... Spelunking? Okay, now I'm interested. Oh yeah, yo, spelunking. And in in book two, he kills a giant mega worm. That's like, yeah, it's cool. It's cool stuff. It's cool stuff. Uh, I I learned that word first. And where in the world is Carmen San Diego as a kid? And I just love the way that word sounds ever since. Carmen San Diego is the beginning of the edutainment genre, which is like my favorite thing ever. So I'm totally on board with that. Okay, Why are you Doc, giggling at me, Doc? It's funny. You're funny. Yes, that's why I'm here. Yeah, that is that is true. Anyways, moving on from Carmen San Diego. <laughs> okay, so what is it that makes your series special, other than apparently it was originally written by a 15 year old? Nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. No. Um, the uh, the to, to be to be completely frank, I'm very very honest about this. One of the reasons why I am so proud of, of the Shadow Reigns and its success is that um, I I it, it was it was originally written by by me as a, as a 15 year old, and and the fact that that I, I managed to rewrite it and make it a lot less just like oh my god, the first the first version was was so bland. It's 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 awful. Um, I'm really, really proud of that, and and I do, I do think it's, uh, I do think it has a lot of areas that I could have Im uh, improved on, but singularly when it comes to when it comes to fantasy, my big belief is you create something that people are really comfortable with, and then you just twist enough to give them something fresh. And my big thing that gives uh, gives us something fresh is um, Rin. It, oh, that's a shoot. That's kind of a kind of a spoiler. Um, uh, my big thing is a is a is my secondary character who is a who is a dragon. Uh, hyper intelligent, funny, uh, in my opinion, but he wields a sword and he wields it really well. And so you have this like armored dragon man running around, cutting things in half. Um, and the fact that he can also turn into like a 40 foot dragon and just like decimate everything is, 
like like as 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 a dragon enthusiast and since so many fan like fancy fans love dragons i think that my dragon is just a little bit different from um even a lot of the variations and not saying that he's better but he's different and it gives just a little bit of that freshness to to the character just completely ignore the main character and focus on rin it's fine it's rin okay. does kind of steal the show i'm gonna rin tell does. you so now i want to do read the book. show now I want to do a fireside chat or like a, a panel about dragons because the only other person I've seen get this excited about dragons, aside from Doc, who thinks that uh, they can exist in sci-fi, which we know isn't true. Pern, I'm totally fancy. Ah, uh, excuse but, me, genetic uh, engineering and Chris Fox. Um, he has them in his. Have y'all seen? Have y'all seen yeah. Rain of Fire? Uh, I was yeah. gonna say Lindsay Broker. She goes nuts about her dragons too. Yeah, I really, really, I didn't, I didn't know that. I'll have to, I'll have to ask Lindsay about Wait, that. Um, Ringo has them too in his um, la, uh, ma the um, Council War saga. Mm, there you right, go. So I, will, that's I, I will add dragon panels, and uh, and we can have this argument at another time. But we do want to talk to him about a Mark of Kings and pimp the heck out of this. Uh, yeah, book we're here for my book. book. God. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Doc, so what, what tropes do you feel Mark of Kings hits best? <laughs> I know no one's going to want to pick up this book after I'm done talking about it. I am super, super proud of it. But someone recently, so Blood of Kings, book two, just released on Wednesday. Um, and, uh, and one of the issues that we had is we didn't do ARCs. We didn't do ARCs, um, uh, advanced reader copies, because I was like, ah, the first one did fine. The second one's going to do great. No problem. And the first review we got was a one-star review. Which it has since it has since now has seventy five five star percent five star reviews. So, so don't worry. But the first person really didn't like it, and they they summarized it by saying it's the summary of the troll trope, which I didn't realize was a thing. But it's apparently this like big oafish main character who just like saves the day by floundering around, um, which <laughs> which I don't really think is true. But there's definitely elements of it with. With uh, with Declan that that I could just I just couldn't cut out completely from when I was fifteen, but what I am proud of with the series is is the fact that I I have especially in in moving through book one and into book two, like taking that challenge of taking the troll trope and making Declan much more interesting and making him much more powerful and, and a lot more charismatic than he was. Um, so there's a little bit of of troll trope in there, but I I as as much as I hate to say it, not to not to go back to kicking the 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 very the very big live winged horse, uh, the dragon. Like if you like dragons, you you are so not going to be disappointed in uh, in the Shattered Reigns. Uh, it's Rin is to this day one of my favorite characters, um, and writing him is just so much fun. And and getting in the head of a of a dragon who is almost a thousand years old and has seen the world and so many people go through things and like. Dragons are just so cool, and when you get to make them a little bit different, when you get to make them just uh, a little bit more than than what a lot of people think of dragons, it's it's really satisfying. So so I'm gonna have to go with uh, with the dragon with a very small side dish of apparently troll. So <laughs> I actually only know of one other author who's actually gone back to their uh, books they wrote as a kid and then redone them to for modern release. Glenn Stewart did that, but he hired or brought on Terry Mixon to be a co-author to make that happen. Um, so he jokes that there were like three people writing that book with him, 19 year old Glenn Stewart, Glenn Stewart and Terry Mixon. I, it, it's funny that you say that. I, I just realized I've been a complete asshat and haven't mentioned my, my co-author <laughs> on this series, Luke Spilenko at all this entire time. So I feel we'll really bad. On, he, we'll just th let him throw you under the bus. That's fine. Luke will throw me under the bus. He's too the... Canadian to do that. He's too nice. It's, hey? it's, it's, it's fine. <laughs> uh so so luke actually um luke actually had a had a heavy hand in in that what you were talking about jr of the, of the rewriting where uh, i i finished the fourth book of uh the wings of war and i was like i was like huh i've got this thing like sitting on the shelf but it's definitely gonna need a little bit of cleanup like who can i talk to who's like very successful really cool guy friend of mine luke luke at the time was like it, he still is one of the most successful lit rpg authors out there and i know that he was trying to get into the fantasy uh industry uh the fantasy genre and i was like you know his his stuff is fantasy enough. It would be really cool to see if we could bring his his audience over to me if he was interested. Um, so I gave him the book and I was like, "Would you be interested?" He's like, "Yeah, sure." We looked at it. and We were like, "This is great. We're only gonna have to rewrite seventy percent of it." Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, 
I yeah, think yeah. Luke being so nice and polite and being like, it's okay. It's not a lot. It's just 70%. Oh, yeah. Luke, if I had come back and been like, no, we're publishing it as is, no changes, he would have been like, sure. <laughs> Destroyed his career. Just be nice. Um, so, nice. yeah. <laughs> when I looked this book up to prep for the show notes, I noticed that it was listed as a military fantasy, which I didn't actually know Amazon had that category yet. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, so yeah. What is it? I told you they had that category. Yeah. I haven't seen it listed before, all right? Jeez. Okay, because super, you didn't ever get out of the sci fi. Yeah. Get out more, well, JR. Clearly, but we've already had that conversation, and the listeners are going to put recommendations in the in the Facebook group. Uh, we'll list it at to the get end. Get you out of the and, closet? Sure. We don't want to offend people, oh. so I'm just going to move on and ask him what it is about military fantasy that um, draws you in. Uh, I. It's the it's the epic scope of things. Um, so the uh, in in the first book of this series in, in particular, we never really get to, to touch on that. But uh, but the uh, let's 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 go with something you might be familiar with. So uh, have you read um, Naomi Novik, uh, um, His Majesty's Dragon? Yes. His Majesty's Dragon. I don't know. If no, I has not. Uh, oh my God. Okay. So if you want if you want to experience military fantasy at its best. Um, the epic scope of what you can do when you in, insert um, fantasy into into uh, <laughs> essentially warfare um, is absolutely insane. So so you know you always you always think about like these epic battles and and et cetera et cetera. Um, and what you never really put into play is 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 consider. And you know I, I do not have experience in, in the military, so so I have to do a lot of research and a lot of bullshitting to like to make it work. But like when you create these these epic scope battles where you will actually apply tactics and you apply advantages and you apply environment and you apply and you apply like everything from altitude to, to whatever you you create this this just immersion where suddenly you are on the battlefield in a way that just being like and this side was throwing fireballs at this side and it was great and everybody died um and uh, and so just try Naomi Novik for example. It's the Napoleonic Wars with dragons, and you'll you'll see it. You'll see like the planning. You'll see the you'll see the 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 advantages that they apply, the ways that they lose, the mistakes that they make, how they learn, how the army learns, and it's friggin' brilliant. Before anybody picks up my book, please go pick up His Majesty's Dragon. Just yeah. If you want to see a a funny take on fantasy combat. Uh, the Angry Staff Officer is a podcast, which is uh, the host is an active, well, he was at the time, was active duty military and a staff officer. Hence, he was always angry because he had to deal with all the idiots. And he broke the heck out of, like, when he did his breakdown of George R. R. Martin's uh, combat scene on the TV series. Yeah. And he yeah. just, like, went to town. He's like, this is the stupidest thing ever. And here's why. <laughs> and he was, you know, it, it's glorious. He did that to Rogue One as well. It doesn't. It doesn't surprise me at all, and that's and that's something that that um, that that applies to 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 almost any any um, uh, expertise. Um, so, like, if you went into like, I get into epic battles in in my in my Wings of War series and in, in the most recent books, and I guarantee that Doc Doc has been going through my my Iron Prince stuff, and and I've already apparently screwed up the ranking system, so I can't even imagine what the battles are going to look like. Um, but if uh, if she went You're in and looked at my there you go, yeah. But if, if she went and looked at my battles, she'd be like, like that's, that's, not how, this time. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not how that works. That's not how any of this works. Um, I have that same, I used to be a, a physical therapist and uh, not to compare physical therapy to being a soldier, but the, the concept of uh, the concept of like, someone will take like an arrow to the shoulder and just like break it off or pull it out and suddenly they're swinging their sword and you're like, what the f are you doing? Like, that's not how this works. It's not how any of this works. So, so I imagine, I imagine, especially for active duty and anyone who has an expertise in basic military warfare, they look at anything that, that those of us who don't do and they're like, what? <laughs> Qua? Yeah, that, uh, that always bugged me. So I've actually been shot in the chest. It hit my sappy plate. So the ceramic plate did its he job. And I'm like, okay. He deserved it. No. Yeah, I got, I got shot twice, but I can tell you both times, like, even if it hits you and it deflects off your armor, that still hurts like a mother. Like it's, oh, I it's can't painful. imagine. And so the idea that they go through all that pain and yeah, there's adrenaline, you can put off some of it, but if it's cutting tendons, depending on yeah. where it hits, like you can't just make those tendons heal because you're angry and you've got adrenaline yeah. going. Yeah. If anything, that makes the blood spurt out a little quicker. 
Oh, it's 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 oh. my my favorites are are so so like so like if like in the shoulder for example like you you hit that capsule and and you you're just screwed. But my favorite is like you'll see the you'll see the you'll see the movies where they shoot them here like just under like your clavicle and they're like that's all meat like that's fine like and then they just like move on. Well, the lung is a little bit above there. The subclavian artery is there. Like, like you get yeah, shot the there. Nerve innervation in like, your like, 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 entire in your left arm. arm. Like, it's just like this. Not really any. Like, you might be able to get shot like a little bit in the shoulder, and like there's some outer meat of your thigh. But like anywhere else, and you're fucking bleeding, and like you're not swinging a sword. It's like, maybe like your side, like um, you know, where most people's <laughs> love handle area is. If it if it just skims the surface. Then it could be but a flesh. That's one way to trim the love handles. I, 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 I actually did that. I actually did that in another, another book when my character got shot with a crossbow in the uh, in the back, and I wrote it when I was like twenty one. And then I went to PT school and I graduated. And so before I published, I rewrote that. And I was like, we're gonna move that like six inches to the side, and he's just gonna get kind of love handle shot just like right through. And I was like, that's hand wavy enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can get away with a lot of things with magic. Uh, uh, or yeah. nanite, but or nanites, anyway. yeah. yeah. I have, <laughs> That's I like have, the uh, of sci-fi. Yeah, I have genetic re- reconstructing in my uh, in my Warform series, which which does a lot. Like, <laughs> very helpful, very helpful. So it's a very you, beautiful piece of hand waving. So Whee! you mentioned you mentioned your your favorite little dragon, uh, and you told us a lot about your main character already. But were there any other secondary characters that were especially memorable? And if so, can you tell us about them? Uh, I, I honestly, as, as, as like, I guess, I guess they're, they're not, they're not bland, I should say, but as like mainstream as they are, I am in love with my entire little posse of this, of this series. Um, Declan, my, my main character is, is a little bit of a troll, but, but it, it works really well in context with, um, with, uh, uh, Rin, but also with Esther and Bonner, who are the, the other two characters. Esther is the beautiful elf girl that, of course, is the romantic interest, but she also <laughs> they're traveling with her dad, which isn't weird at all. But her dad, her dad is this like seven hundred year old like old fart of a mage uh, who could just like snap his fingers. And there's this there's this one scene that I had to rewrite where where Esther is getting objectified by uh, by by a dick in a uh, by a dick in a pub, and uh, and Bonner is shaking. Her dad is like shaking in anger. And uh, and Declan is like like chill, dude. Like like take it a break. And the dick is like, what's what's wrong, old man? Like, are you are you angry that like you can't do anything? And Declan in his head is like, no, you idiot. I'm trying not to get him to blow up the entire half of this city. Um, so I, I I love the dynamics of of their entire little posse because like Bonner in particular is hilarious. He's 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 smart. He's sassy. He is not like the the. Uh, the mages that you typically see who are just like stroking their beard and wise. He's like cracking your mama jokes and like, like being, he's, it's, he's a lot of fun. Um, and Esther, Esther was the first, uh, Esther was my, it, it was actually really pleasant going back and, and rewriting um, Esther's character because I didn't actually have to rebuild her character much, which I was really pleased uh, with myself, my, my younger self and shout out to my mom for being, for being an awesome female role model. Um, but, uh, but I didn't have to rebuild her, her character at, at all to make her a really just badass, like, like female. Just, yeah. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's, it's, it's so much fun. She's also, she's also smart. She keeps Declan in his place, which is a lot of fun. So most epic fantasies, and this definitely has the characteristics of an epic one have bad guys can you tell us a bit about your bad guy without giving away any spoilers <laughs> do you want do you want original bad guy or or or, or current bad guy from, from this book <laughs> both um, original uh, one for the bit and then original original one was was just this so so i i i took some elements he was called the immortal and he was this mystery like oh like scary undead wizard guy very original not at all copying skeletor it's cool um but uh, but in the in the in the second book, I I managed to actually make my antagonist um, a little bit more interesting because she never she never really takes any sort of direct action in these books. Um, her name is the Endless Queen, uh, Saranya. She's a uh, she's a uh, I'm trying to 
I'm trying to like parse out exactly what would be what would be spoiler or not, but um, she's an ancient. She's a, a witch who originally, a long, long time ago, used necromancy to threaten the the, the safety and balance of the world. And Bonner, Rin, and some other people rose up, took her down. You know, very original fantasy storyline. Not at all copying a thousand other uh, a thousand other fantasy stories. Um, but uh, I'm very critical of my own work in case that in case that wasn't obvious. Um, but uh, Saranya has poked her head up again, which is very odd because she was she's she's supposed to be dead. Um, so she was called the Endless Queen at the time because she used the undead for her for her nefarious deeds in the past. But now they're like, yo, that whole like double meaning thing. We probably should have called her something else and not jinxed our asses. But um, she's she's also very very interesting. I. I I, I can't really say too much more without getting into without getting into spoilers, okay. but I'm I so, like her. What would happen if your characters met you in a back alley? Like, how would you fare? So, okay. Um, someone else <laughs> actually actually told me because because I, I had mentioned that I was going on this podcast, and someone else had, had mentioned that that they had that question. I thought that was a really cool question. Um, <laughs> that he's I, not going to answer. <laughs> no, no, I'm totally going to answer it. I'm probably going to be wrong because so my characters. Um, one of the things that all my fans know is that is that uh, my books can be very grim and dark, but my characters are going to end up on top. Like everyone is going to get their happy ending. Everyone is going to get what they want. Like within the main characters, I fucking kill everyone else. Like everyone and their mother and children is literally up for grabs. But my main characters are 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 going to get the happy. They're going to get the payoff because that's the kind of fantasy that that I love. Um, and so I thought it was a really interesting question because. Uh, like so many, like, like when I think about like what I put them through, I'm like, oh, they would, they would hate me. But at the same time, like, I know how the stories tend to end for my characters and they end up like very happy. So I'm kind of like, it depends at what point in their life <laughs> you're, you're talking. Like at the end of the whole story, they'd be like, like, yeah, you know, it was, it was tough. You only killed like half of my family and most of my friends, but you know, I got, I got to happiness in the end, but anywhere in the middle, and all of my characters would just absolutely obliterate, like, like I, Roz, Roz especially from the Wings of War, like has tortured people on scene, including an old lady who very much deserved it, I swear. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, that's the thing. There's a challenge, go pick up the Wings of War and find the scene where he tortures an old lady and and, and you will sympathize with me, I trust you, trust me. Um, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, that would that would not be a good encounter unless it was after the end of a series, and then they'd be like, "You're you're okay, you're cool, you're okay." <laughs> after everybody gets their happy ending, they'll put up with you then, huh? Yeah, Is that I, it? I, I I I think so. I think so. Other than that, they would just yeah. <laughs> so, what would you say is your favorite character archetype? How many times am I allowed to use the word dragon in this uh, in this <laughs> podcast? <laughs> It's okay. So, so, so more recently, um, I discovered uh, I discovered progression fantasy thanks to uh, the likes of um, of Turtle Me, uh, the beginning after the end, Andrew Rowe, obviously, Will White, obviously, um, and that the whole the whole like true underdog, like uh, the underdog, the, the the farmer, the farm boy has always been a thing in, in fantasy, but like the 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 archetype where you see someone you can just statistically watch them grow has been a, a huge huge thing for me in the last about three, four years. But before that, and still currently, non-humans are fascinating, fascinating oh. to write. Um, oh, was, was that a dog? Oh, perfect. In, in um, there you go. Um, non-humans are fascinating to write from, a, from just like a burnout perspective. Like you don't get as tired of being in a non-human's character head as quickly as you do of being in a, in, in a, in a fellow human's head. Um, like I can just spend all day in, in Roz and Rin's head, um, and, and various other non-humans that I've had. And the other great thing is uh, for, that that's just from like a reader perspective and just like enjoying writing my characters, but from like a professional perspective, the single best thing about writing non-humans is that I can make them do shit that I could not ma let my humans do without being, without having to like explain why, like there, there will be times where I'm like, that's like a, it's like a 12 foot like wall. And I'm like, he jumped, 
<laughs> it jumped and it was hard. Like he put like his claws in the wall and like grabbed and but like you can you can make them do things and the suspension of non-belief by your readers is significantly higher when you're writing a seven foot tall winged dragon man than it is when you're writing even like a six foot five like like white guy who who's good who's good with a sword. So so there's that's my best answer for you. <laughs> okay. So we like to ask some times authors about the sausage where and how it was made were there any scenes that you wrote that you cut and did you use them later so this is this i this is a uh the wrong the wrong book to to ask me about that because literally 70 percent of the book is lying somewhere on the cutting room floor um <laughs> uh so in any other book i would actually say no I, I i was just having a conversation with uh um michael j sullivan who who is a fantastic fantastic mentor to any fantasy writer out there who has the the time if, if he has the time to 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 talk to you because he's very very busy but um but he was showing me he's, he's got this like whole setup within Scrivener which is a, a writing uh, program that that we use um and he's got his chapters and scenes and everything uh spread out and he can move stuff around and it's brilliant it's absolutely brilliant and he was like yeah you could absolutely use this and I, and, and I was like I could except that I finish a draft and I never cut anything I have I have never in my life cut a significant like amount of material, um, and I've definitely never uh, put it back in. Um, I've rewritten some stuff. I've I've gone back and killed some characters just to make my life easier because too many characters is is hard, and I am a very lazy person. Um, so so in general, the answer would be no. But uh, in a Mark of Kings, yeah, I cut seventy percent of the book. And no way in hell did it show up later because there's a really damn good reason I cut 70% of the book. <laughs> Go yell at my 15 to 17 year old self. Well, there you go. All right. That was a, that was a good answer. We will take it. So finally, what can you tell us about the universe itself? We, we know that it has elves and dragons and, and trolls, um, but what, uh, <laughs> what can you tell us trolls. about it? Because in a lot, of, a lot of the good books, the universe is as much a, a character as the protagonist <gasps> and the antagonist. So spill it. Uh, the the universe in this um in this series is 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 a lot of fun because it's super comfortable. Um, there's there's really not a lot to to challenge um, the 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 fantasy reader in this, which which I personally enjoy because I've tried to I've tried to challenge them in other ways in in how my characters interact and, and some other some other stuff. Um, and I'm a, I'm personally a fan of it, very much a fan of it because it it's it's that nostalgic fantasy setting, which to me was my favorite thing i'm i'm a i'm a very like long writer there's most of my critics not most of my critics but the most consistent thing i see in my criticisms is i take a page to explain something that could have been written in two sentences which is technically right but i like to i like to craft the world i like to to try to find the balance between explaining in detail and leaving enough room for for the 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 reader to interpret but but sometimes i i get inside my own head and inside the own the the scene and i just end up trying to paint what i see um and and in this setting i i'm really not ashamed of of the really classic like forested like fantasy setting and then the sweeping like snowy mountains and 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 the there's there's a there's a, a woods that we haven't visited yet but i'm pretty sure i'm going to make kind of an eternal autumn um uh, because this this was the the first book I ever I ever wrote and and I I I wrote it I think I, I we kind of touched on this earlier but I wrote it I think because I wanted to try to create the world that was in my head I wanted to try to to create a world that that I would have really wanted to go to and customized it um, and back then and and still to this day like that that place like the Black Forest in France and Germany like like those spaces that you can just walk into and just feel like you're in a fantasy world. And I just, I wanted that classic feel. I wanted that classic experience of someone walking into the woods and just being transported. Um, and, and that's honestly what the universe draws from. And I, I'm, I'm very pleased, pleased with it. I'm, I'm completely okay with, as opposed to, as opposed to my white bread main character, which I will not continue. I, I'm so aware of this. Uh, I am totally okay with my, like classic fantasy universe and and how it adds to to the feel and and the the sensory input of of the book. Okay, well, a Mark of Kings is clearly part of a series. I know because it says so on Amazon. It says so on your website, and you've told us there's currently one book out. And um, at the time I looked, uh, we're recording this on there's the twentieth. Two books, two books out. Two books. There's drop book right. two. 
All right. Well, you just it it yet. It's, this is being recorded on July 20th. Um, yep. So is their story done? Will there be more from these characters? Where do you see this universe going? There will definitely be more from these characters. Um, uh, book two, uh, book two just dropped last week. Uh, so for those of you who have been waiting for book two of Mark of Kings for two and a half years, I'm so sorry. Um, but it is finally, it is finally out. And I personally, honestly think that it's it's better than than book one. It's completely fresh material as opposed to book one was was a rewrite. Um, but no, these characters have have, have a long way to go. Um, and uh, and I know how I want to wrap it. I know how I want to to create the the ending, um, craft the ending. But uh, I couldn't answer how much longer it, it has. I'm I am the only the only writer that I know um, who uh, who is more of a pantser than than me um, is R J. Uh, hold on, let me just make sure that I give him the. Uh, Correct, yeah, R.J. Barker. Um, <laughs> R.J. Barker uh, is the only writer that I know who's more of a pantser than, than I am. Um, other than him, I, I, I literally fly. I just, I don't plan anything. I just go, 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 go. So this series could have one more book. I think it's gonna be probably four or five based on what I have in my head right now. But yeah, if I, if I fall in love with it all over again and just keep going, I could extend into infinity, who knows. So, you every world has its own in consistent, internally consistent magic. So what kind of magic system can readers expect from your book? I'm gonna take a, I'm gonna take a drink of water right now to think of how to carefully, carefully answer this. <laughs> uh, I am so bad um, at, creating hard magic systems that, that have laws. Like I said, I wasn't kidding when I said I'm a very lazy person. Um, in, in the art war from subreddit, when people ask me questions of like, what's the lore, what's this, what's that? And I tell them, I have no friggin' idea. Um, and the reason I do that is, is because I, 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 keep, I keep the consistencies in my head so that when I'm writing magic, it, it, tends, to, it tends to remain consistent. It tends to have these obscure, undocumented rules in my head. But I, I wish I, I wish I could tell you that I have like these these laws and the like, but honestly, I try to keep everything as open as possible. And uh, keeping in the rule, there's a major rule of like build on what you have before you create something new. So mm -hmm. I try to create this like broad sort of sense of what is possible, um, especially in a first book. So so there's a lot of showing with the magic in a Mark of Kings. You know, um, uh, there's. There's like an internal joke, like when Bonner is teaching Declan about magic, there's all these laws and these theories that, and, and arcana and all this stuff. Um, but but Declan, of course, being a completely original and not at all like like creative bastardization of a thousand other uh, series is a is a prodigy with magic. He's absolutely brilliant, which is so creative of me. Um, and uh, and so I had to show through Bonner's abilities, which are just world ending, what you can do with magic, and he does so many different things um and it's and it's fun to actually go into declan's head and 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 be more specific about like you know the the breaking them down into oromancy pyromancy vertomancy all these things and showing like where it's more structured because he's developing in certain directions um so as of right now i don't really have any like hard directions and hard rules aside from a breakdown that i that i did do just from like an academic level for for bonner teaching him of of the various uh, um, classifications of, of houses of magic, I, I guess you would say. So Declan is a pyromancer um, with uh, with a splash of, of, of what I call corpomancy. Um, he's uh, he uses magic to strengthen his own body. But uh, but Bonner in the meantime is just over here, like taking the heaven and just tossing it down on a poor slime because it's annoying him. Um, so it's there's <laughs> sky's the limit, no pun intended. So. If you had any magic from your universe, what would it be? And how would you abuse it? Uh, from this universe specifically, as this, okay, this is gonna be a sad answer, but um, uh, Bonner has Oromancy, which is, uh, he specializes in healing. Um, and uh, for one thing that allows him to have a very extended lifespan. And, and I'm, a, I'm a big believer in, in in YOLO in the best possible way, you know, don't do anything stupid, but like experience the world uh, for as long, for as much as you can, because even though I'm 
31 years old, I, I really feel like I only have half my life left because of how fast things things go by um, as you get older. Um, and so oromancy to, to extend my, my own life, but also um, I suffer some chronic pain issues, which uh, nothing severe, nothing debilitating at any point, but enough that um, I, I miss I miss the time in my life where I took my body for granted. Um, and that's, that's been a, that's been a, a heavy thing to carry for, for a while is, um, is just like knowing, knowing what I used to be able to do and knowing how I used to feel and knowing how I feel now and, and what limits me. Um, and I think I would, I think I would take oromancy in order to, to get back that, as, as weird as it is that that youth uh, that I say there's a 31 year old who's in relatively good shape, um, but two blown discs, chronic plantar fasciitis. Uh, I have something called um, uh, wow uh, photophobia uh, in one eye, which is awful for a writer staring at screens, um, and some other stuff. Plus, I get to keep I get to keep my my doggy around for longer, and I get to keep my parents around for longer, and and family and community and helping people like that would be a really big boon otherwise i'd just pick pyromancy so that i could just blow shit up because that's fun no more traffic no <laughs> get out of the way <laughs> bruce almighty so excellent reference i approve <laughs> <laughs> you've talked about some of the fantasy creatures in it um did you go about creating anything that really inspired you? Like, did you use nightmares or daydreams or just your uber crush on dragons to inspire you? <laughs> uber crush on dragons forever. Um, uh, that's that's a, a really interesting, uh, a really interesting uh, like thought. I, I don't, I don't know if you would call it daydreams so much as just like cognitive wandering. Um, I have, uh, I have pretty severe ADD. Definitely not ADHD. I don't, I don't mislabel that because I'm, I'm definitely functional, but. Um, my ADD is both my worst enemy and my greatest weapon. Um, the reason I do I juggle so many things is because I have I've compensated by instead of being distracted by something else, I just get distracted by one project and I just end up going in a circle. Um, and when I'm plotting and when I'm working in my head about what I want to do, uh, I essentially just let the brain go. I just let the mind go, and and whatever whatever it comes up with, whatever it pairs together, I, I couldn't tell you where stuff comes 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 from but um in this series uh there's a there's a species called there's a, a group of monsters called the Warren, which are which are really interesting to me personally because they're these uh stitched corrupted uh half human half animal beast creatures that are are really really nasty um and like like a half human half animal is, is is not anything new but they're not anthro they're they're literally like stitched half human half animal like intelligent beings that are like really creepy and really terrible terrible and it's the kind of thing that it just it pops into my head and i really couldn't tell you where it comes from um i'll, I'll get ideas when i'm i'm walking I, i'm a kinesthetic thinker uh, or the whole classic like i have a i have a not anymore i actually keep it on my phone but i used to have a notepad next to my bed because i would be like oh such a long day start to fall asleep and there's 20 ideas that i'm like well now I'm away because I gotta write this. I gotta write this shit down. Um, but uh, but honestly, I I <laughs> if if I could recommend having uh, having a, a, a floundering mind for any creative, I would. Although it certainly comes at at a cost in other areas. I can understand that. So okay, so clearly we're winding <laughs> this thing up, and hopefully the doggo quits barking long enough for us to finish. But uh, before we wrap this up, was there anything about A Mark of Kings or the Shattered Rain series that we didn't ask you that you want to uh, tell us before we move on? No, you guys you guys have done a, a, a fantastic job. Uh, just, again, a, a shout out to a shout out to, to everyone who, who helped me put this together. Luke, Luke especially, Billy the artist, Sean the, uh, Sean the typographer. Um, the, the, only, the only thing that uh, you know what? I'll take I'll take this moment to to shout out my my message to the world uh, after after that follow up, especially for people who are who are hopeful writers. You won't do it alone. No one does it alone. Don't be afraid to ask for help. No one is an overnight success, and no one is is successful on their own. 
find the people that that you can work with find the people that that are going to help you out and that can support you and 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 add to to you because when you develop those relationships they help you create stuff like like the shattered reigns which i'm very very proud of and i'm so happy to have had the the friends and the acquaintances and the professionals that i've worked with to get it out there but that's that's honestly about it you guys have been awesome so is it out in audiobook as well yes. yeah yeah it's with nick padel as the narrator yes. which is fantastic. my favorite Again, I, and, and thank you to Nick so much in Podium at uh, Podium uh, Audio. But Nick, Nick does an absolutely wonderful job with uh, with the series, and and I just I just started uh, actually listening to a Blood of Kings because I can't read myself. Um, uh, <laughs> and uh, Nick is Nick is just brilliant. He's honestly brilliant. Oh, JR. JR. Uh, no, I was adding Podium to the. Um... To the show note, the hashtags, excuse me. Yes. Uh, I'll yep. learn this 21st century stuff someday. One day. Um, yeah. So the hashtag was always like pound the pound sign until recently. Get off my lawn. Um, so <laughs> how, how can listeners find you? And we'll link all of this in the show notes. Yeah. Um, I can I can be found in a lot of places. Uh, the only place that I really can't be found is Instagram because Running an Instagram as a writer is hard. Like, who wants just like, ah, here's a screenshot of like some random words? Um, although my dog is very handsome. Um, but I can be found on Twitter at uh, O'Connor Books. Um, and then I can be found on Facebook at Bryce O'Connor. Uh, and then the uh, other great places are my publishing company, Wraithmark Creative, is all over the place. And then we have a subreddit for the Warform community at our Warform that's steadily growing. And it's just an absolute blast. Um, but yeah, you can you can find me anywhere. Reddit, it's uh, it's Bryce O'Connor at Bryce O'Connor, and I'm on there every day on our fantasy. It, you'll find me if you're looking for me. You'll find me. I'm not I'm not a recluse. I'm in fact I'm an, I'm annoyingly involved in the community, and you will just get sick of me. So don't reach out. I'm warning you now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I will add the uh, the Reddit to the show notes, and the Googles will find the way. Uh, you can find us on our website at anchor.fm backslash blasters dash and dash blades. Anchor.fm backslash blasters tech and tech blades. You can follow us on Twitter at SF underscore fantasy underscore show. Sierra Foxtrot underscore fantasy underscore show. It's almost like that SF stands for sci fi. Uh, you can email us at blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. Again, that is blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. I promise you, we actually answer them. Uh, we've only got three hate mail letters this week, so uh, I blame Saska. And um, she actually wrote them to me, so, you know, what are you going to do? Um, you can follow us on Facebook in our Facebook group where all the shenanigans happen, which is facebook.com backslash groups. That's apparently important. Backslash groups, backslash blasters and blades podcast. You can support the show over on buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Hanley. Be sure to put in the show notes that it's for the podcast, and I will keep Nick Garber and Doc Seska duly intoxicated. They will drink until their liver surrenders. Never surrender. Never quit. Nobody likes and a quitter. That's right. Nobody likes a quitter. Drink another one. And um, if you drink every time Elvis barks, I apologize for nothing, but uh, <laughs> you're going to need to deliver. And uh, you can also support us over on anchor.fm backslash blasters tech and tech blades for a reoccurring monthly subscription. If that's more your, your style. All right, doc, bring it home before he starts barking again. <laughs> Thank you for spending some of your precious time with us for the absentee adult brain, Nick Gerber, the, well, insane J.R. Handling because he loves his pineapple. I'm Seska. This was the Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back next week. Same time, same place. We're all in your love of picking on J.R. nerd culture, cheesy jokes, things that go boom, and trying to convince J.R. that Dragon Con really is not a tiny thing. I mean, it's got like, what, 1,200 people, right? Yeah, no. Try it more. hit 95,000 people last year. And by last year, I mean the year before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those tiny little cons. You guys are comp.